Wendy, Wendy Sloan is going to lead off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Uh, my name is Wendy. This is Connie. Uh, Connie is going to lead off. Um, Connie, Dev, and Lucy. And our project is an analysis of San Jose's Community Service Officer, or CSO, program. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. But we had the opportunity of working with Mayor, Luc Mayor Lucardo's office on a study looking at how exactly CSOs are utilized statewide in California. And we are really excited to be sharing our findings with you today. So to give you a brief overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Community Service Officers, who they are, what they do exactly what the current CSO program is in San Jose, which started just recently in 2014, and what the politics is surrounding the program. Connie will then um, talk a little bit about our research questions and our data and methodology, a core component of which is a survey that we distributed <coughs> statewide to different police departments, asking them how they use their CSOs. Deb will share some of our research findings from that survey, <coughs> and Lucy will close with a couple of implications and what this exactly means for San Jose, which is currently considering expanding its CSO program, or actually in the process of expanding its CSO program. So to give you a bit of background information, community service officers are non-sworn officers who customarily handle lower priority calls that do not require the same skills or training that sworn officers um, do. So they generally do not carry firearms, they generally do not have the power to arrest, and typical CSO duties can involve crowd and traffic control, um, collecting evidence, road hazards, missing persons, and um, doing a lot of admin work within the department. And objectives of CSO programs are one, to free up sworn officers to answer to higher priority calls because CSOs will typically address lower priority calls, and two, to build relationships between police departments and communities because since the 1960s, a lot of social unrest has led police departments to hire more civilian officers to refamiliarize communities with police departments. So CSOs are called different things in different cities, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're just going to refer to them as CSOs. In San Jose, the CSO program emerged as a response to a declining and overworked police force. In 2010, the city auditor had recommended CSOs be hired as a way to fill in staffing gaps. And so the program was rolled out in 2014 with 24 CSOs to assist sworn officers with lower priority calls answering to burglaries, um, theft, missing persons and road hazards, and crowd control. Um, and so CSOs, here's a picture of a CSO. This is probably the vehicle that you saw, Joe. But they <laughs> ride in white city vehicles, and they don't wear the traditional um, police uniform, but a, a light blue shirt. They undergo a five-week training where they learn about a range of topics from um, criminal law investigation to CPR and first aid. And they, in San Jose, they do not issue parking or traffic citations, whereas in other cities, um, other CSOs do in those cities. And they do not carry firearms, and they have to call sworn officers if situations escalate. Um, CSOs are currently drawn from a central pool, and what that means is that they are part of the San Jose Police Department's communication division, which provides 24-hour services for emergencies. And so there are not enough of CSOs to be embedded in different divisions within the department, and Lucy and Deb will talk more about that. So a lot of different divisions within the department draw from the central pool, and that makes CSOs more of a multi-purpose staff for the department. And in 2015, $3 million was approved to hire 24 additional CSOs, um, so a two-fold increase, and that they're currently in the hiring process for that. So the expansion of the CSO program is particularly contentious. We've listed a whole bunch of stakeholders here um, who are interested in this, in this expansion, and the, the top one being our client. Um, but it's particularly contentious because of budget restraints. As you can see on this chart here, the number of sworn officers hired from 2005 to 2015 decreased from about 1,400 to 1,000, um, primarily due to city-wide budget cuts. And so um, Mayor Licardo, for instance, believes that CSOs will be beneficial um, and cost-effective, whereas um, the POA, or Police Officers Association, the Union for Sworn Officers, thinks otherwise, and thinks actually that CSOs will, will pose a threat of mission creep or um, this idea of encroaching on sworn officers' duties and responsibilities. Um, so to inform all of these stakeholders, we have pursued a study looking at how CSOs are utilized statewide, um, the methodology of which Connie will now go over. So Wendy already gave you a little bit of background of CSOs and in San Jose. So that targets our first question. What are the duties of CSOs and sworn officers in San Jose? And how do these duties compare to those in other cities? 
Secondly, we wanted to look at how cities across California design and implement their CSO program, and how do these programs fit within each city's jurisdiction, um, or each jurisdiction's police department. Lastly, we wanted to look at what factors contribute to the success of a CSO program um, in other California cities, and then bring it to San Jose, like what alterations might San Jose do to their CSO program in order to um, benefit their program and based on the common practices in other California cities. So in order to do this, we conducted two main method methodologies. And first we wanted to look, before the looking at these two, we wanted to look at literature review and see what other studies have been done around CSOs, but we haven't found anything yet. So this is the forefront of CSO um, <laughs> data and all that stuff. So we're really excited to share with you what we found in our survey and follow-up interviews. We conducted a statewide survey um, to observe CSO trends in police departments and compare statistics and bring it to San Jose. Secondly, after doing this follow-up, doing the survey and looking at the survey results, we conducted follow-up interviews and this supplemented our survey data. Secondly, we looked at dispatch response data that was given us to, given to us by the city of San Jose. And what this dispatch response data was is essentially it's an aggregate number. Um, it aggregated the number and type of dispatch calls San Jose CSOs and sworn police officers currently respond to. So jumping into the first um, method that we used, the survey. The survey was the comprehensive bulk of what we were trying to, um, what would answer our survey research questions. And in order to complete the survey, we conducted initial interviews with CSO experts and police departments. And after conducting these interviews, we figured out what best, what, which best questions would answer our research um, questions. And so we drafted and finalized a survey with, in consultation with the mayor's office, um, Stanford survey experts, and the National City Police Chief. And the National City Police Chief was a um, huge proponent of our survey and actually helped us disseminate the email, um, our email survey to the CPCA and CSSA, which is the California Police Chiefs Association and the California State Sheriff's Association. So our survey went to every single police department and sheriff's office all across California. So after we concluded our survey response um, gatherings, we looked at the responses and determined which, which, sir, which cities and jurisdiction police departments we really wanted to focus more energy and more of our time on conducting follow-up interviews with. And in order to do this, we, we wanted to focus first on very large cities and jurisdictions because the city of San Jose is a very large city. So with this, we looked at Oakland, Orange County, Sacramento, and San Diego. Secondly, we wanted to look at cities with high ratio of CSOs to sworn officers because San Jose is trying to expand their ratio. So these cities that took our survey um, and we conducted follow-up interviews were Anaheim, Elk Grove, Garden Grove, Newport Beach, and Redlands. Lastly, we looked at other cities um, that were sort of outliers in the survey responses in that they potentially indicated that they didn't use their CSO program all that effectively, or their CSO officers only had one job duty and it was specific. Um, so we wanted to see what what these programs were and like get more information on how they were running it. So this was Chula Vista, Davis, Palo Alto, and Santa Ana. And so um, that was the follow-up interviews and the anecdotal stories that we got from these interviews really shaped our common practices um, for the CSO program that we were going to bring to the city of San Jose. Lastly, our last methodology that we used was the dispatch and response data that the city of San Jose gave to us. First, they gave us dispatch data um, that expanded multiple years, and it was a large sample of data, and essentially included all the call types, the priorities, the final disposition, everything that um, the dispatch would give to CSOs and sworn officers. However, we were unable to differentiate which calls were being answered by CSOs and which calls were being answered by police or sworn officers. So ultimately, after large back and forth movement, we got aggregated dispatch data from um, the city. 
and this aggregated dispatch data was only specific for certain call types that they wanted to give us. Um, that some that CSOs are commonly um, responding to. So these were um, for this these call types. We were given the number of calls answered by CSOs versus sworn officers, and also an hourly breakdown of the number of calls answered by a CSO or versus a sworn officer. So this was very um, narrow. It pretty much narrowed down the large data set, but it also didn't give us a comprehensive look at all of the call types that CSOs are responding to. Um, so data, um, Dev is going to um, talk about the research findings that we got from the survey and the dispatch data. So I'll be focusing on the research findings from the surveys and the follow-up interviews. Um, and then Lucy will talk a little bit in the implications about the dispatch data. That's kind of how we're, we're, we were able to end up bringing that in. We were not able to do a comprehensive analysis of the, the calls currently responded to by CSOs and police officers in San Jose compared to other cities. Um, so we can really only do kind of a quick and dirty for the implications. So for the survey, uh, as Connie mentioned, it went out to all of the police departments and all of the county sheriff's offices in the state. And out of the 331 police departments, we received 147 responses. Um, so that's about a 44% response rate. Of course, we, as you can see, we only got two responses from the county sheriff, so we know that that's uh, not a representative sample. But out of the 389 total jurisdictions, we were able to get a 38% response rate. And looking at just the, um, the jurisdictions in the, from the Police Chiefs Association, we did kind of a population um, comparison between that, that population and um, the respondents. And what we saw is that we actually, our sample it has small towns, large towns, and small cities are underrepresented in our sample, and the larger cities are, are slightly overrepresented in our sample, which actually turns out to be a good thing since San Jose is one of the largest, it's the third largest city in California, so they're more interested in what's happening in those large cities anyway. And what we also saw was that when we just kind of took a first look at the data, there was a really strong 0.9 positive correlation between the population of a jurisdiction and the number of sworn officers. So we uh, hypothesized that, that, which makes a lot of sense, <laughs> uh, but we hypothesized that, that because there was such a wide range of respondents in terms of population that we needed to break it out. Um, so we did to see if there were there was a difference in whether they did their uh, whether they even had a CSO program and how they how they assign duties to CSOs. So it turns out that um, you can see we, have, we broke our population um, jurisdictions into six buckets or six categories from small towns to very large cities. And you can see that uh, the vast majority of them in the fourth column here do have a CSO program, um, but that the larger cities are much more likely to have a CSO program than the small towns and the large towns. Overall, we had about, I think it was about 84% of respondents had a CSO program, so a large, large proportion of the respondents do have a CSO program. And it turned out that a lot of the duties um, weren't, ended up not being different um, between the smaller programs and the larger programs. And in fact, the CSO program size does not correlate really well with population, even though the sworn officer size does. So in terms of the research findings, I'm going to talk about the program structure for CSOs. And this is going to be kind of a myth because we, we don't have, um, we did, we did follow-up interviews, 13 follow-up interviews, and we saw that there were different program structures and we're not sure which are best practices because we are not, we don't have enough data to, to actually follow up on um, what's most effective and in terms of asking the survey, there was a survey question that asked how helpful that they thought their program was. And this is, of course, just one individual respondent per jurisdiction. And 94% of them rated, on a scale of 1 to 10, rated their CSO program as an 8 or better. So we're not able to determine what's more or less effective. Um, so the program structure will, will be based on the interviews rather than the survey questions. The CSO duties that I will discuss 
will come out of the survey responses. Sorry. And, <laughs> and um, both the survey responses and the follow-up interviews expanded on the CSO as foreign officer working relationship. So that will inform, both the survey and the interview will inform our third research finding there. So in terms of program structure, there are actually three different ways that CSOs are deployed in a jurisdiction. One way is they can be assigned to different divisions, such as the Crime Prevention Unit or the Investigative Unit. Uh, another way is they, can, they could be assigned just in, across precincts, just like police officers. And then the third way is to be assigned in, in both places or to kind of have a rotation. What we, what we heard from the interviewees is that they liked whatever their particular structure was because it allowed the, the CSOs to develop expertise in either specific divisions, specific fields, or in specific areas of their city, if it was a large city. And they, they felt that the, this expertise uh, increased the efficiency and the effectiveness of the workforce and also improved the working relationships between the CSOs and the police officers because they were having repeated interactions on a daily basis as opposed to the way that San Jose does it being deployed from a central pool they actually don't have a lot of interaction with individual police officers at least not repeated interactions. We also found that some departments said that whether they designed it that way or whether it just happened that a lot, a lot of times CSOs would move um, out of the CSO program and, and actually apply for higher paid civilian positions within their department or um, there, there were both those that moved into civilian positions and then also those that went to the police academy and, and then became a sworn officer. This is helpful for a police department because it cuts down on their recruiting costs and some of their training costs because the CSOs are already have already been trained and working in that in that department. So what we have here are the duties that we got from our survey responses. This is just the top ten. Um, we asked about I think eighteen. <laughs> duties or so, and what you can see in the, the blue bars are the percentage of jurisdiction, jurisdictions that said they assigned CSOs to that particular duty, and then the red bar are the percentage of jurisdictions that have CSO programs that, also, that assign police officers to that specific duty. So all the way on your left is administrative and clerical work. 94% of jurisdictions assign CSOs to that administrative and clerical work, and only 41% of them also assign that, that kind of work to police officers in the, in the same jurisdiction. So there's um, not a lot of overlap in terms of administrative and clerical work, and then from parking enforcement all the way to uh, responding to vandalism, kind of the middle bars, you can see that there's actually a lot of overlap in terms of both CSOs and police officers responding to those types of calls or being assigned to those types of calls. And then when you get over to the right in terms of patrolling the city and investigating vandalism, that's much more likely to be assigned to a police officer than assigned to a CSO. In terms of the working relationship, uh, we did hear a little bit, most of the programs are pretty well established. And so the, the fact that tensions may exist at first was something that we heard from people who had been around for a long time and who were there when the CSO program had started and said, yeah, there was maybe a little bit of hesitation. But we, as I had stated before, we got the um, impression from everybody that the CSO police officer working relationship over time had gotten a lot better and um, that sworn officers actually appreciate having CSOs because then they don't have to do the kinds of calls that they didn't become cops for. They didn't become cops to fill out paperwork. Uh, but everyone stressed that if it was a good working relationship, it was because there was a clear delineation of duties and the process for assigning a, a CSO or a police officer to the shared duties. We did find that there were um, most CSOs belong to a collective bargaining unit, and only 29% uh, of those belong to the same unit as sworn officers, which uh, some of those mentioned that they thought it helped align the interest and alleviate some of the concerns between uh, the, working of the working relationship between CSOs and sworn officers. And now Lucy will talk about the implications for San Jose. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm going to discuss uh, what all of this means for San Jose specifically, and I'm going to talk about these implications for San Jose in the same three categories that Dev talked about, um, our research findings. So these are the CSO program structure, uh, CSO duties in San Jose, and the working relationship between CSOs and sworn officers in San Jose. So looking at the program structure, um, we think as San Jose continues to expand its CSO program, um, they consider making um, a few organizational changes um, to their program. So the first is dispersing um, or embedding CSOs in different divisions, both by subject area, so um, in their investigative unit, in their crime prevention unit, um, and also in um, geographically within different precincts. And so the benefits, as Deb mentioned before, um, include um, the work benefiting the working relationship between CSOs and sworn officers as they repeatedly interact on a daily basis and increase familiarity. Um, and also um, increasing their institutional knowledge as they, and, um, and uh, subject area expertise. If, for example, they're working in the investigative unit, they get better over time. Um, the, second, um, the second suggestion is that they uh, deploy CSOs, when they're deploying them geographically, they consider the different needs um, of the different neighborhoods in San Jose. So some neighborhoods have higher incidences of quality of life calls. So these might be, for example, um, property crimes or nuisance complaints. And these are areas where they can deploy more CSOs. So that way, in areas with higher, um, with higher violent crime levels, um, or priority one or two calls, so for example, armed robbery or those kinds of things, um, they can free up sworn officer resources to focus um, their efforts in these areas. Um, the third area is expanding CSO um, working hours. So currently, we found that, based on the dispatch data, uh, CSOs in San Jose are currently underutilized between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., um, whereas about 93% of the calls out of the, the types of calls that they handle occur between um, 5 a.m. to midnight. So by just increasing their working hours in the beginning by a few hours or and increasing them in the evening by a few hours, they can cover 93% of the, the calls um, that occur during this time. And the fourth area is um, implementing a police academy pipeline. So um, San Jose, like many other cities in California, is having a lot of trouble recruiting and hiring sworn officers. And so cities like Sacramento, um, Davis, Elk Grove, they're addressing this issue uh, by adding a CSO program to the, uh, adding a police academy pipeline to their CSO programs. And cities like Sacramento and, um, and Davis are actually working with local universities um, to try to recruit younger candidates. So we think this is something that, um, that San Jose can consider as well. So the second category um, of implications for San Jose is in the CSO duties. So on the left-hand side of this, um, this chart right here, these are all the different call types that, um, that CSOs currently do handle. And as you can see, all of those duties are shared with sworn officers. At this moment, CSOs handle about 50% of those calls. And on the right-hand side, these are the, uh, the duties that CSOs in other jurisdictions are trained to handle. Um, but that they're, they're not currently covered by CSOs in, um, in San Jose. And you'll notice that enforced parking takes up a big part of that. Um, currently in San Jose, they're covered by the Department of Transportation, whereas in other cities, they're covered by under the police department by CSOs or not. Um, but in our conversations with the mayor's office, they were very, very interested in um, parking enforcement in cities that do parking enforcement. And while they didn't explicitly say, though, the, say so, the implication is that they may be considering looking at um, as shifting those duties to, um, to be covered by CSOs under the police department. And so um, in the, uh, out of all these possible duties, if um, these possible duties, um, these are uh, cover the January to September 2015 timeline that, um, that Connie mentioned before, um, there are about 282,000 total calls um, into the police department over this time. Um, and if CSOs were to cover all of these duties, that would be, um, uh, about 10% of those calls. And so the final um, category is improving the working relationship between CSOs and sworn officers. So in our conversations with our client, this was something that they were very, very concerned about. Um, their CSO program is very new. It's very controversial within the police department and externally. And so, um, so this is something that we really focused on when we were talking in our follow-up interviews with cities, other cities in California. Um, so the, uh, San, Jose, San Jose's um, CSO program has only been in place for about, um, for about a year. And so it's, 
um, unsurprising that there would be some initial tensions as uh, sworn officers and CSOs figure out their roles um, and their relationship with each other. But we, um, based off our conversations with other cities, we just think um, it'll just take a lot of time before, um, before the relationship begins to improve. And um, a lot of this will be because sworn officers will come to as CSOs take on some of the, the noise complaints or administrative work and these kinds of jobs that, in, frankly, in other cities, cops didn't want to take on anyways. Um, they'll come to appreciate the support that CSOs can provide. And so um, a big part of this is um, two things we found that can maybe accelerate this process a little bit. And the first is making sure that the responsibilities um, of CSOs and, um, and sworn officers and the process for dispatching um, them in response to calls is really clearly delineated. Um, and so we want to make sure um, that this is, um, this is the case both for dispatch, CSOs, and sworn officers, that everybody is really clear on the delineation of responsibilities. And this is important now uh, to address the initial concerns of mission creep that the police officers are concerned with, and in the future, because um, anecdotal evidence from Davis, from Oakland, showed that um, they have long-standing CSO programs. And when there are tensions, it's not because police officers think that CSOs are encroaching on their territory, it's because they're getting calls that they think CSOs can handle and that they don't want to handle. Um, and so the last one um, is targeted messaging and clear messaging for San Jose CSO program. Right now it's seen by the Police Officers Association, by a lot of the sworn officers within San Jose, they feel like the responsibilities are being taken away, that they're being replaced by CSOs. And so we think it's important um, to improve acceptance of the CSO program, that, um, that it's communicated as support for officers and not as replacement. And so some of the analogies that we like are that CSOs are to sworn officers, as paralegals are to lawyers, or as nurses are to doctors. They're not replacements, but rather um, the support and resources that police officers need to do their jobs to the best of their ability um, and to use their training to the fullest extent. And so I just want to sum up the implications um, that we believe that San Jose can consider, or as they um, continue to develop their program and expand their program, they can consider organizational changes to the, to the CSO program. They can expand CSO duties and working hours um, and um, uh, improve the CSO relationship just with time and also through targeted messaging um, and making sure that um, the delineation of responsibilities is really clear. Um, and going forward, we initially really wanted to do a data-driven um, study using um, the full uh, several years of dispatch data that we were given, but unfortunately we weren't given supplemental data to um, be able to break that down and look at budgetary and performance implications of, CS of San Jose CSO program. So going forward, we just recommend that they do this type of study, um, and we think that that will really help with um, guiding the efficient staffing allocations in the police department. So, thank you. talked about this the other day, and it sounds like you've come to a more firm conclusion. Is this really about parking? Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that, because because the initial the initial direction from the mayor's office was huge. Yeah. It was broad, it was about cost effectiveness, and it sounds as though in the last week, maybe you picked up something else that you think that this was about parking and, and or who does parking enforcement. And I guess that's one question. The second question is, um, is it because of the politics behind that? And I know the mayor's trying to build a better relationship with police officers union. So he'll anger someone else, but maybe he'll make friends with the, with the POA. I don't I, know what you think. I think that's definitely a possibility. They were very interested. They So in every single conversation we had with them, they kept saying, well, CSOs in Palo Alto do parking enforcement. What? Like, what other, what do other cities do? And they kept saying parking enforcement, parking enforcement, parking enforcement. So we made sure to include that. Um, <laughs> because some cities, there, there are a fair number of cities that have their CSOs doing parking enforcement. It turns out Palo Alto CSOs only do parking enforcement. So I don't think they're looking to move to that model because they already have DOT, um, Department of Transportation employees who literally just do parking enforcement. So that's basically the same thing. Um, whether or not they're trying to placate the police department by bringing parking enforcement underneath the PD umbrella, it's hard to say. They might be.
questions? Other questions? Yeah. I was curious if there was any thought in doing kind of like looking at these outcomes of when you start incorporating the CSO uh, and program into like a city, for example. Was there any thought in doing some form of difference in difference, for example, of looking at like what was crime before, what was crime after? Yeah, so that was our important? initial okay. thought that we would try to try to do that, even though the um, San Jose program had, had only been around for about a year. Mm -hmm. But um, we couldn't we couldn't break down that data. Really. I, was, I guess I was thinking and there more. Were, we did ask that, that question in the survey, just an opinion. Do you think that crime um, reports have decreased over time since, since implementing your CSO program? And of course, it's just an opinion. But everybody said no. And in the follow-up interviews, not everybody, but I think the vast majority, it was over 80% said no. And then in the follow-up interviews, we asked about that. And they said, well, actually, people may be more likely to report now that they know that the report's going to get taken. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the case on college campuses, too, and like UC Davis or Sacramento State. That Sacramento State has like 78 CSOs on campus, and they have reported like reduced crime in like parking garages and whatnot. So it's very, in, in college campuses, it's a and Another benefit, or one of the main benefits, is also decreased response time. Um, so for so um, without CSOs when they're just sworn officers, um, they focus on the higher priority calls. Yeah. So with the lower priority calls like um, property crimes, they're either they don't um, respond to them at all, um, which has been the case with San Jose when they um, de began decreasing the budget a few years ago, or they um, they take a really long time to respond. So part of it is decreasing that response time, uh, which I think 64% said that it decreased. I mean, again, this is not based off any data. This is just sort of based off the respondents' feeling. But that's something that we would have really liked to look at, but we, given data uh, limitations uh, that we were given, weren't able to. Also, your survey yield was awesome, like almost 50% <laughs> response. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> These just follow rules. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the sheriff's not sure. Sure. <laughs> 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 so, so true. On the back of that question, if San Jose came to you three years ago, would you have recommended this? I think, so the survey responses were overwhelmingly positive about how helpful the CSOs are. And again, just it's just opinion, but they said it decreased response times. So yes, I think we would have. And I think we would have recommended that they organize it, their CSO program differently from the outset. Yeah. So you, you recommend uh, increasing hours from 5 a.m. to midnight for the CSO. Uh, channeling Bruce Kane, how much is this going to cost, and where would the money come from, well, and would it piss off the police officers? Right. Well, they're they're already um, and they've already expanded, decided to expand their CSO program from 24 to 48. Um, so they have more numbers of CSOs. So it's not necessarily that we're just ex um, for so like for example, CSOs might be pissed off if they're asked to work more hours for the same pay. But with the with the addition of CSOs um, of the twenty four additional CSOs, it could, their shifts could be arranged differently. Um, and I mean, to be quite frank, police officers are already unhappy um, with the with the presence of CSOs in the first place, which is why we have um, some measures to increase the working relationship. So in terms of increased costs, they're, they've already decided to hire them. So we're just looking at how to allocate them maybe more effectively. And, and 